Awesome. Welcome, everybody. We are super excited, super excited to have here a webinar to talk about turning your product into lead generation machine while we let people in and wait for a little bit. If you know Wes or myself, we usually start off with a question of today. So while we're trying to get engagement from you, making sure that you're, you're engaged here, question for today is name one thing you've checked off on your bucket list. And I'm just going to type it in the comments. Feel free to share it in the comments as well. Name one thing you've checked off on your bucket list. And I have your Randy, uh, co-founder at Nevatic, and Michael, uh, growth at Taplytics. But let's start off with uh, Randy. What is one thing you've checked off on your, from your bucket list recently? Yeah. Hey, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks, Ramley. Um, One thing I've checked off on my bucket list recently. So a few, I guess this was probably about a month or two ago, I did a West Coast road trip where I drove from Gosh, I drew from San Diego all the way up to Seattle and then back down to San Francisco. So I explored the entire entire West Coast, did some uh, fun fun trips, some sightseeing. So that was something I've wanted to do for quite some time now. Some that must have been super fun. And and you, Michael, what what was um one thing you checked off on your bucket list? Uh, let's see here. So I've been a big snowboarder for like ten plus years, and I've always wanted to make the switch over to skiing, just like go faster, be more like agile, whatever. Um, and I told myself that if I'm going to switch over to skiing, I'm going to do like a big West coast trip. So I went over to like Whistler, Banff in Canada here. Um, and I just, I put myself in the deep end for, for skiing over there. And it was, uh, I learned a lot. That's pretty awesome. Um, and so you've been skiing how many years now? I'm sorry. I missed I switched, I switched to skiing this year, actually. Oh, sweet, sweet. Well, that's, so, that must be a big challenge. We yeah, have other people. Challenge. We also have other people in the comments saying, um, Caddy said, running a marathon. Uh, just feel free to exactly name one thing that you've checked off on your bucket list. We'd like to get engagement there. This is going to be super fun, uh, making sure everybody's involved as well. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to share it in the comments. But today's topic that we're dealing with Nevatic is turning your product into a lead generation machine uh, with the product tour. Um, we are wait waiting for one more co-host, but I think I, maybe we can start with introductions. If you can go to the next slide. Yeah, sure thing. Well, before we do that, we need to hear your bucket list. Oh, shoot. How could I not share what mine has? <laughs> that is, thank you. Uh, for me, one of the, my bucket lists that, I, that was been on my mind for five five years was like writing a book and I wrote a book this year got got it published in June uh, product led onboarding and was really a, a big challenge like just one of the things I said was there was a point in writing that book where I was smacking my head on the table and I was just like why did I put myself through this uh, and just really wanted to give up with that but I, I pushed through and now we have this book that can really help people with with their onboarding experience. I've cool. heard some amazing things about your book as well, Ramley. Yeah, I can't wait to read it. Oh, well, Breezy's here now. Awesome. Uh, we're just talking about uh, bucket lists. What's one thing that you checked off on your bucket list recently, Breezy? Um, I did a half Ironman this summer. Um, so that was on my bucket list. I used to be a competitive marathon runner. Um, and I have so many injuries. I can't quite do the full marathon distance anymore. Um, but I was really excited to do a, a, a half Ironman. I'm not a swimmer. Most wow. people are either swimmers or runners. There are two different uh, types of folks out there. So that was fun. Wow. That's a huge, huge accomplishment. Congrats. Well, thank you for everybody for, for chiming in and sharing that. Uh, Today, we're talking about turning your, your product into a lead generation machine. We have here Randy Frank. He's co-founder of Nevatic, Breezy, head of growth and marketing at Correlated, and Michael, who is growth marketing at Athletics. And it's going to be super fun. Exactly what we're going to jump into here. Did you, you all of you wanted to share a little bit more about yourself or uh, anything else about yourself that you want to jump in? Sure. Happy to start here. Uh, hey, everyone. Randy Frank here, one of the co-founders at Nevatic. We help teams build interactive product tour. So this topic is, is very much top of mind for me. So excited to dive into it later today. Um, I'll go next because I'm on this slide in the, this, this next spot. Um, I'm breezy. So yeah, I run growth and marketing at Correlated. Um, basically what we help people do is uh, get product signals into the hands of the sales team for expansion opportunities. Um, and so my job is uh, gets pretty nitty gritty in, in a lot of the details of this uh, 
of, of both the growth side and conversions and also on the marketing front. Everyone, my name is Michael. I'm on the growth marketing team here at Taplytics and we're a digital optimization suite for modern enterprises. We help companies increase their ROI on the features they release and enable them to optimize their customer journey and product experiences through experimentation and future flags. And uh, yeah, like Breezy said, I'm in the nitty gritty of growth marketing here. So um, can't wait to share it with you, Alex. Awesome. Um, well, hey, thanks everyone for joining again. Really excited to jump into it. So just to run through the agenda for today's presentation, uh, a few things we're going to cover. So the first is really talking about why is time to value more important today than it ever has been before. The second piece is how do we better align value between the buyers and the sellers? And then the third piece we'll dive into is how can we use our product to really delight our early users and customers and generate more leads from the get-go? And then we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So as we run through this, please think of some questions we can ask. We'll have a few panel questions scattered throughout as well, but hopefully we have a lot of time at the end for a lot of audience questions also. Cool. So jumping into the first piece here is let's actually step back, you know, putting our self in the buyer's shoes. We've all bought software before, right? Let's, let's put ourselves in the buyer's shoes and really explore why are we actually going to a vendor's website in the first place? So the first piece here is self-education. So maybe I've heard about a vendor, maybe I'm evaluating one of their competitors. I just want to know more about this offering. However, today we have so much information around us at all times. More than ever before, we have resources like G2, Captera, other reference sites to go through. We can see an unbiased review of a provider without having any other website. So if it's not self-education, maybe it's pricing. You know, I mean, I've heard about this vendor. I've done my research. I want to learn more about the commercial side to see if this solution actually makes sense, financial sense for my organization. But as we all know, you know, not every organization is fully transparent about pricing directly on the homepage. This can be due to a number of factors from evolving pricing models and usage-based pricing and enterprise tiers. So sometimes it's hard to actually get a full snapshot into the pricing model uh, before you ever talk to a sales rep. So if it's not self-education, if it's not pricing, you know, maybe third and finally, it's, I just wanna get started. You know, For this audience here today, PLG-centric audience, I'm sure this is all top of mind for us. You know, As a buyer, I would love to hop into a product, start a freemium, start a trial, really start playing around with the solution and do an evaluation to really determine, is this product going to meet my needs and business challenges? However, you know, as we know, not every product today is, is built for freemium. It's not built for PLG. Some tools out there require a lot of setup, training, handholding, deep integrations with your systems before you can really ever jump in, start testing and see that value. So if it's none of these, you know, as a buyer, um, I'm still forced, I'm, I'm going into a website, I need to talk to sales, I need to talk to someone, that's frustrating. So looking at the next piece here is, we actually saw a study from Lead Connect. It's taking 55% of companies over five days to respond to these inquiries. Now that's, that's wild. We also looked at another study specifically for B2B SaaS companies that we performed earlier this year, about hundred companies without a freemium, without a trial, we found that the average lag time was about 4.3 days. So let's think about this. In that time, you know, almost a week, what is your prospective buyer doing? They're losing interest. They're probably evaluating other vendors and they're allowing the status quo most dangerously to remain the default option in their business. So let's take a step back here and look at what does this new buyer look like? Why are they so antsy to get hands-on? Let's look at this changing buyer landscape. So buyers today are used to results really at the click of a button. So a stat we found is over 45% of B2B buyers today are 25 to 30 years, 34 years old. So this demographic, they've grown up with technology. They're grown accustomed to quick results at the click of a Google search button, or they pull out their phone and they download an app. Think about our consumer lives. I can get value from a product in a matter of seconds where I can download an app, test it out, delete it if it's not gonna be for me. However, this rarely translates to the B2B world. I have to go through this process of talking to sales. I have to go through this process of requesting a demo. It's pretty frustrating. A lot of tools out there are not designed with this product first approach. Um, so you know, sometimes a freemium, sometimes a trial is possible, but oftentimes it's still gonna require me to talk to sales, to learn about pricing, talk to sales, to get started, talk to sales, to see a demo. So when a, a user visits our site, our goal as vendors is to deliver value. 
So this value can come in a lot of different forms like we just spoke to, but, and we'll continue to explore in our session here today, but in this fast moving world with a lot of distractions, a lot of things competing for our attention, I don't wanna wait around for this wow moment, this value moment before I can jump in and see a product. Cool. So we talked about the time to value. Now let's look, about, let's look at the alignment of value. So when I go into a website um, as a buyer, right? I'm expected to give up some information for a vendor. So say, for example, I want, I need to uh, submit a form. I need to submit my information. There's an inequality in terms of what a vendor is giving versus what I, as the buyer, am giving to up to a vendor. So as we mentioned in this new era of B2B software buying and acquisition, self-education is at an all-time high. Now, by the time I visit your website, I've gone to Gartner, I've done my research, and by the time I get to your site, I know exactly what I want. So by me giving up information in this form gate, information is now a two-way street. So what I mean there is as a buyer, I have high expectations when I go to submit a lead gen form on your website or I reach out to a vendor that I'm gonna receive something that's also valuable to me. So looking at an example here, there's a give and take. So I, I go to your website as a prospect, I'm giving up my name, my phone number, my email, my company name, my team size, X, Y, Z, all this stuff. What am I really getting in return? I'm filling out that form gate because I believe I'm gonna get something valuable in return from a vendor. I'm gonna get some information that's gonna help my business, uh, my buying decision. But realistically, what am I getting? I'm getting an ebook. I'm getting a video recording. Maybe I'm getting a white paper. Remember, I as the buyer, I'm more educated than I ever have been before. I'm going on your website because I want to get some sort of value add insight that I can't get elsewhere. Additionally, let's think about this from the vendor side, right? Is an ebook download really indicative of product interest? You know, as a marketer, can you confidently say, yes, Randy is a MQL because he downloaded a video and maybe he did or didn't watch it? There's just not a lot of, of information there that's helpful for either side. There's almost this social contract, if you will, in place where I'm trading a piece of content in exchange for that prospect's name, email address. In this agreement that yes, I will reach out to that prospect in future in, in the future, contact them. However, there's still this misalignment of interests. So that was a little bit of talking. So let's jump into our first panel question. When you go onto a site as a, as a buyer and you volunteer this information to a vendor, what is your expectation here? What are you expecting a vendor to do? What are you expecting to receive as that buyer? Maybe Breezy, we can start with you. Yeah, for sure. So I think one of the things you touched on is and I think you use words like contract is that there's like a sort of a mismatch between the information that we're giving up, like especially when it's a really long form and we're, we're telling people our name, our email, our company that we work for, the maybe the number of employees. There's, there's a lot of information that we're giving up. Um, and so there's a mismatch between how much you have to give up and what you're getting. And there was a time when that was acceptable, but I think we're, you know, we're moving past that. And a lot of companies are moving towards um, ungating all or most of their content. And so now we hit this phase where it's so important for a company to be able to collect that information, right? We want to know who's on our website. We want to know who's looking at our stuff, but how can we also provide enough value at the same time? And so I think, you know, as both a buyer and have some, having someone come to my website as a buyer, um, you just want to make sure that what you're offering is going to be of the same value of what that person's giving up for it. Um, and so I think that's when we look at conversion rates on different forms and things, I think that's really what we're looking at is what you're offering enough for that person to take the time and fill it up. So um, I, I, I guess my piece of advice there is if you're going to be gating something, you want to make sure it's really high value and that they can kind of be tactical and take some, something away from that. That makes total sense. Michael, any, any comments there? Yeah, I mean, if um, just like on top of Breezy's point, like if it's my first time volunteering information to a vendor, like I expect them to understand where I fall in the customer journey, whether I'm evaluating them for the first time or I've come back to the page more than once. Um, I expect them to really understand like where I am in the customer journey and provide and determine how much value I should be getting where I'm at in the stage, whether it's the awareness stage, consideration stage, um, just enough to push me down the funnel. Exactly. And, and like we said, you know, the buyer is more educated than ever before. Giving them something that they actively want is the expectation today. You know, I'm giving up 
information that, and the expectation that, yes, I'm going to be contacted by a sales rep down the line. It better be worth it. It better be worth something that's going to help my business making uh, buying decision. So um, that, no, that's great. Ramley, any, any points to chime in there with? Yeah. I, I mean, I love what Michael and Breezy said. I think what it's also getting at is around context, contextualizing your, your that expectation. Um, my, Michael brought up the customer journey, but if it's not the first time that this is the, the you, you volunteer the information, I expect to have a different kind of outreach than it, it was my second or third or fourth time because I'm starting to show interest in, in the product. And, you know, I think just having all that information, whether I've, have I signed up beforehand for your free trial freemium or have I already done something else within your, your realm and really figuring that out can really like help provide a contextual response to this rather than just a, um, hey, would you like to jump on a demo right at the get-go? Totally. Cool. Well, let's, let's keep rolling on here. So to recap here, we've established that buyers today expect results very quickly. They're willing to exchange that lead information, my name, my phone number, my email for the right value. But ultimately what they want is they want to get in front of the product and start evaluating that solution to see if it's going to be the right fit for their needs. So on the slide here, we have the lead generation machine, right? We have this, this balance between the prospect and the vendor, but there's an ex equal exchange of alignment, uh, a value alignment. So how can we improve that user experience and create this machine that both generates leads for the vendor, but also provides an equal value to the prospective customer? Our goal as vendors should be thinking in this mindset, right? We want to start this relationship on the right foot. We want to provide the maximum value for, for a prospective user, for a prospective customer um, to, to really build that relationship from the get-go. So, you know, the dream here is how can we use our product to sell our product, right? We want to, the goal is let's build a product so great it sells itself. That's oftentimes not the reality. Sometimes, it, as we mentioned, building that, that freemium, that free trial can take time. It can take engineering hours. It can take setup. It can take integration. How can we get this product in front of our buyer much, much faster in the deal cycle to get them excited, get them hands-on, and get them interested in what we have to offer? So this is where I want to talk about the, another option, which is the lead generation product tour. So the lead gen product tour is, is really helpful for teams that are just not in that position to launch a free trial, launch a freemium, or fully embrace a completely hands-off PLG motion. You know, again, this can be due to a number of reasons from setup time integrations, lack of engineering hours. Um, and so this is where that, this product tour can be a really powerful tool to both drive early engagement while collecting valuable lead data. So as a buyer, I'm actually getting to explore what I want to see, which is the product. And I'm exchanging, as you'll see in step two, you know, some information about myself. So I'm signing up for this social contract that yes, it's okay to come back and contact me because I'm getting what I want to see. I'm getting the product, I'm getting hands-on, I'm getting experience, I'm getting that wow moment right out of the gates. So with this interactive product tour, website viewers take this new call to action, as you see in step one there, see it for yourself, try it now, take a tour, whatever it is, it's this new CTA on the website. I can fill out a form gate and I can actually get hands-on with this lightweight, clickable version of your product. This is before I ever set up an account, before I ever integrate with my data sources, before I ever talk to sales. And what this does is it really evens the playing field. Um, so both the marketing team can generate the leads they need to create more MQLs and, and help, help out their sales organization. But from the prospect side, I'm actually able to test out the functionality. I can start clicking around a demo account and really get that hands-on experience. I can't get with an ebook. I can't get with video recording. I can never get with a white paper. So lastly here, you know, unlike the traditional recorded demo or a white paper, something like that, the product tour is really powerful also from a marketing perspective because I can track engagement, right? I can see that Ramley came in on a certain date and time. He, he got through 25% of this feature, but he went through 100% of feature B. Next time we talk to Ramley, let's really focus on feature B. That's really valuable data to, to help track user engagement and really refine those MQLs and, and those buyer intent scoring models that you're just never gonna get with traditional assets today. Cool. With that, I'd love to hand it over to Michael to talk about an example, um, a case study, how they're using a product tour on their website. Um, so yeah, Michael, go ahead. Thanks, Randy. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned with Taplytics, we're a product suite with experimentation and future flags. So now for those of you who are familiar with the space, you know that experimentation and future flags 
tools can have all sorts of features and it could be a very complex solution. Now, back in Q1, when we started evaluating the use of a product-led solution similar to Amplitude's product tour, which is a, a product analytics tool where you can interact with the platform and features in a more guided sense. Now, if you check their website, they built an in-house fully fledged out product tour. And we debated back and forth on the time and resources it would take to build and the overall return and value. Cause at that point, I mean, you don't have unlimited resources and dev resources as a growth marketing team, especially at our scale to implement something that significant. And you need to be sure that, or validate somehow that this is gonna drive growth for your business. And so that's where we encountered Nevatic. And then we started using them as, as you could probably say like an MVP for a product led solution. Um, since we didn't have the dev resources to spend on a fully fledged out product tour like Amplitude, but this still did give us an opportunity to test the channel since um, Nevatic did provide something very similar but allowed us to get to the market faster. So after setting up all the plumbing and attribution and putting it up on our homepage navigation bar, as you can see on the slide and attaching it as a site link extension for our SEM, we found that 35% of the opportunities that have been through a discovery call and has been accepted by an AE has touched the product tour at least once. And out of those 35% that have touched the product tour at least once, 65% of those have converted. So what does this tell us? Well. If we think about the buyer's journeys today, as, as Randy mentioned earlier in the, in the webinar, they're much more informed as we are when it comes to purchasing products ourselves. So not only are they gonna be looking at your website for pricing, your features, maybe a competitor landing page, et cetera, but they're looking for a way outside of that commitment of signing up for a trial account or dealing with salespeople to set up a demo call um, that can take an hour out of their day. Um, so they're really looking for something that's gonna add value to them at that point in time. Um, so in the product tour scenario, um, what we noticed that on average, they're looking at four more additional resources on top of our product tour um, before committing to a call. And with the product tour in our scenario, especially selling the, uh, selling the enterprise brands, primarily um, is that although it acts as like another touch point and channel, it really is a catalyst for converting your lead down the funnel, as you can see from the quote on the slide from one of our leads that touched the product tour at one point and eventually ended up signing for a trial account and then eventually ended up signing for a longer contract. So while my points were primarily around the inbound funnel, we've also seen the product tour used as a channel for our current customers as well. With big enterprise brands, there's several different divisions. Your name may spread throughout the org, but if you're looking upsell, how are you gonna engage with those individuals outside of the division that you primarily work for? and have them learn more about your platform outside of the traditional call with the CSM or website resources. So at the end of the day, if you're determining or debating to use a product-led solution or not in the marketing world, you have to determine whether or not your audience sees value from this. And the only way to do that is to test the channel and experiment and see where the PLG solution fits within your lead funnel and then continually optimize to the flow to drive the, the time to conversion. And yeah, back to you, Randy. Or Randy. No, that, that's awesome. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, Olaf, I just saw posted a question. Can you do this without the form? I know, Michael, you all do have that form gate in place. Breeze, you touched on earlier, you know, some teams are just bypassing the form gate altogether, jumping straight into value. There's other ways to track users. We can use tagging and, and tracking and other methodologies like that. However, you know, I think there's a balance, right? How do we want to include that form gate? There's kind of an art form. Do we want to put it at the beginning? Do we want to put it at the middle, put it at the end? At the, put it at the end or the middle, we are gonna see more drop off, but I think those folks that have gone through that product tour at that point and are really committed for that next step are higher intent leads to begin with. Um, so maybe we can you know, take a pause there for some thoughts around, does a form gate always make sense? Where would it make sense to drop that off? Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, I guess it depends on what your CAC or your customer acquisition costs or your cost per lead or whatever metric that you're, you're measuring against and what you're willing to spend to convert that prospect. I mean, if you're willing to drive volume and blow all your ad spend towards the product tour and get it at the very end of the tour, then by all means have that as long as your attribution is set up correctly to understand where the prospects engage. But if you have a lower CAC, then set it up at the beginning. For us, we have it at the beginning because at the scale we're doing, we're trying to limit as much as we can and optimize from there. But um, yeah. 
I think one of the things that will that will change based on where you're placing these uh, forms is is you're going to be your conversion rate down funnel from that point, right? So if you're doing a gate at the end, or it's not really a gate, just a form at the end, um, then it's very likely that that person is super interested in what you're selling, right? And so that sales conversation is likely going to be easier. That com- the conversion rates are going to be higher. If you're gating at the forefront, it's you know, that's people's access to whatever you have on the other side of that gate. So um, you're going to get more, you're going to have a a higher volume, most likely. Um, But then you probably will see it on the sales side, the the funnel metrics will be slightly lower on the conversion rates. So um, I think like anything else, like you you just want to test it for your own company and and, then see what what's sticking. Yeah, I think it makes total sense. And one last plug here is I, I think a product tour is not necessarily a zero one thing, right? You know, for example, if you look at the slide here, we have Tapolytics has the explore product. They also have a request a demo call to action. They also have, I believe, watch a video. So it's one of many, you know, it's a tool in the toolkit for growth marketers. Um, we have customers at Nevadic that both have a product tour in addition to a trial or addition to a freemium. So it's something that is just another way to engage those top of the funnel users a bit earlier in the sales process. Um, cool. I see a few questions coming in. So that's what I wanted to run through today. So I think we have plenty of time for Q&A. We have a few questions we can run through. Uh, so maybe we can start off with one I definitely think is going to be top of mind for folks, um, which is competition, right? So if I'm ungating or you know I'm putting a form gate potentially in front of my demo on my website, there's a huge competitive risk, no? You know, what about this risk of a public facing product demo? How can I ensure that I'm not giving up the secret sauce to my product to my competitors that might be viewing my solution? Let's start here. Yeah, so I think one of the things to think about here is that, you know, is there competitive risk to your your product being out there and your competitors possibly seeing it? Yeah, right, obviously. But at the same time, there's a huge, possibly, in my opinion, much larger risk of not being forward facing about your product and all the capabilities of it. And therefore you're getting a competitive risk from not being public facing. So, um, in that case, you might just be losing deals just because you don't want your competition to be able to see what your product might look like. Um, and uh, in my opinion, and also in what many uh, what many studies of data show, and we, sh- we look at companies who are more product-led versus not product-led in the same exact space, uh, we can see that there's a much bigger risk in being um, left behind than being forward about uh, what your product looks like and, and what it's capable of. Um, one small note on it is that there is always the possibility for blacklisting. So we will we'll talk sometimes about whitelisting, like letting people get access to something. Blacklisting is the opposite. So it's it's blocking certain companies and, and or certain people from getting access. Um, but that being said, you know, we all have created a burner Gmail account or um, <laughs> or people just have another friend who's willing to sign up and show them. So people will likely still gain access. You can you can do some blacklisting just to, you know, cover stage one of the bases. But again, I think really in conclusion, it's that the competitive risk of, of not showing your product and, and, and how much you could be helping other people um, be better by using your product. That's, that's uh, something I wouldn't want to miss out on. Definitely. Definitely. There's always going to be ways to get around a form gate, right? It's kind of like a game of, cat and mouse, right? The the form gate technology or email validation is going to improve, but folks are going to find ways to build new burners or build new temporary email addresses. So there is a risk, as you mentioned, Breezy, but I agree, agree. You know, like if we look back at our conversation, right, there's a new era of buyers out there that say, look, I'm not even going to think about evaluating a solution until I can get my hands on it. And if I want to wait four or five days, that's just too long for me. I need value now. I need value today. Let's get in front of the solution immediately. I think you're being uh, kind by saying four or five days too. <laughs> Maybe four or five days until you get the call with the SDR who's gonna, yeah. you know, validate that that sales should then talk to you, and then they're gonna hand yeah. off, and you're gonna have like five demo calls. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'll I'll talk to an SDR that's probably gonna qualify me out, and then maybe I can work my way into a demo, and then maybe if I'm lucky, I can get seven day trial, but then it's going to take me five days to integrate with segment or whatever it is. So by the time I'm actually getting that wow moment, you know, it could be weeks down the line. Ramley, Michael, other thoughts on, on competitive risks? 
yeah, like what, what Breezy said, like within any PLG, there's inherent risk associated with having it public facing. Um, we have to face the fact that like, even like products, if you offer a trial, like anyone can sign up for a pseudo account and dive deep into your product. But in a PLJ sense, it's just a matter of how much you gate in order to not show off your secret sauce or your family recipe or whatever it is that makes you differ from the comp competitors and giving the prospects just enough to entice them to move down the next stage. Awesome. Cool. Um, let's jump to the next question. Again, anyone in the audience, if you have questions, comments, concerns, throw them out in the chat and we can get to those as well. The next piece is around, you know, how much is too much, right? Say we have a product tour, say we have a freemium or a free trial. What is the right level to showcase this prospective buyer before they've actually signed up, before they've talked to sales, before they've created an account? You know, how much do we want to keep to the chest? What do we want to put out in the world? And I guess it stems off the last question on competition, but I think this is a slightly, slightly different as well. Yeah, I can, I'm happy to jump jump in here. I see the other two are muted. So um, I think, so over at Correlated, um, we actually do give full product access. Um, so that is the way we've chosen to do it today. Um, though I do think as we, you know, learn how people are moving through our product and, and see how different things, you know, kind of kind of click for our end user, we may end up changing that over time. So I, I think one thing to think about too, is that if you decide one thing, it doesn't mean that it's stuck there in cement forever. You know, I think the, the, the thing about um, technology today is that you can be malleable and how much you're providing an early user before they sign up or once they sign up. Um, I, with that being said, I think the biggest thing to think about is what's the experience going to be for the end user. So if they're, if you're giving them full product access and they can see all the features that you have, is that great because they get to see it all? Or is that too much because um, they don't know where to focus their attention or it's overwhelming? Um, they may have a limited amount of time that they've, they've uh, set for themselves to explore your product. And if there's too much there, they, you might have a miss there. So, um, you know, how much can you show that end user and provide value to the end user without making it a difficult uh, onboarding experience for them is, uh, is how I would think about approaching that problem. And that's gonna be different for every single company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Like understanding where your biggest drop-off points are, especially in the product tour for our tabletics in sense. And then um, kind of dialing that back or like understanding like, hey, if they're going through the full product tour, well, they're not converting, then maybe you're not giving enough value. But if you're giving too much and they're dropping off earlier, then you're giving up a little bit too much. So you got to dial that back a little. So it's just understanding like what the appropriate amount of value is and um, observing that. Yeah, Breeze, I think that's a great point. You know, we can, we can showcase our product, but it, ultimately if there is setup involved, there is time required to get to that wow moment, is that worth it, right? If it takes some time, it's going to confuse them. Is that worth it in the long run? If they're just kind of that top of the funnel browsing around, kind of window shopping, do we want them to jump into the full thing where they have to set up their, their systems, integrate with their CRM, whatever it is? Or do we want to keep it a bit more lightweight, have them click around, have them explore kind of that pre-populated, that data-rich environment, if you will? Um, Grimley, I know you quite literally wrote the book on user onboarding. So any, any thoughts on, on that one? I mean, it's a great point that all of you are making around, like you want to remove as much complexity as much as possible, uh, especially, you know, there's this uh, psychological law called Hicks law, where if, if you, the more option you give somebody, the, the, it's, it takes them exponentially longer to make a decision. So I think like anytime you can remove things and really focus on, on what they're trying to achieve within the product is su super, super important. Um, just a best practice that I, that I would really hone in on there. Awesome. I do have a, a few questions coming in. So let's start off with the first one here, which is how long do you grant access for product tour? Um, Michael, maybe you can take a cut at this because I know you have full access to the product tour. So maybe you can talk about your rationale of why you wanted to not have any sort of time based or any other gates there. Um, just open access. Yeah. Um, for our product tour, we've opened up as much as we could throughout all of our features without exposing some of the secret sauce. Um, so the user can go in anytime and re-go in as well if they've already gone through it once. 
um, and they can have full access to the tour. Um, I think time is more important in like a trial sense uh, or like a trial account, but in a product tour, you wanna allow them, like the goal of a product tour is to allow them to explore the platform as much as they can in a more guided sense and not free flowing like a trial account um, in hopes that they turn into a trial account or whatever conversion metric that you have. Makes sense. And Breezy, over to you. I know you, you mentioned the, the PLG motion you all wrote out recently. Is there any sort of time based on the trial or is it a completely free freemium? Yeah. So I, well, I think there's, there's something to think about here when you're trying to figure out what the time is. You want to create urgency. So you want like time can create urgency, but you don't want to create panic. <laughs> <laughs> or like lack of action because of the, the, the time is too short. So for instance, I went on a website recently. It said that I could have a two-week trial. I was like, oh, I don't know if I'll get to it in two weeks. Maybe I should wait to start my trial in like five days or, you know. And so what I have converted, if it maybe was just like 30 days or something like that, and I felt more relaxed, um, probably. So there's there's things to think about there. Like Time can be good to create urgency, but you don't want it to stress out <laughs> the person on the other side. You want them to be able to um, be in control of, I mean, that's what we're trying to do, right? Is let the end user be in control of what their journey looks like. Let them be in control of how they interact with you. Um, and so for right now, actually at Correlated, we have decided um, to not have it be, to not, like none of the language on our website is about it being time-based um, because we just still have so much testing to see, you know, when is the point that people, you know, get to value and get that aha moment and things. So there's still testing for us to be done. So to answer your question directly, that's, that's what we've done, but um, that's going through the mindset of we didn't want the time crunch to be a barrier, but I do think there's value in creating urgency. And that's, you know, that's long live sales. It's always been about creating urgency. So nothing new there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. So looking at Olaf's question here, how interactive is the solution? Do you load it up with dummy data? Where do you sort of draw the line between the real product and this, this fake um, product tour, if you will, Michael, maybe you can uh, jump into that one since you, you do have that product tour up on your site. Yeah, we do have um, some dummy data on there just to show how the platform would perform. Um, at least in that way, it gives the prospect an understanding of some of the metrics that would be available for the user if they were to use the platform. Um, Amplitude does the same thing. You can implement different data sets actually from different uh, segments and industries, which provides a different kind of look. Um, but I think overall that, that just adds more value to, to the product tour itself. Yeah, I, I think Amplitude is a great example because what they've done is I can choose that I'm in SaaS or I'm in healthcare, whatever it is. And that's gonna be a completely different data set that tells my story, speaks my language. And I think that's super powerful, especially as you're first evaluating a solution. Um, let's see, Olaf, and then in terms of an example, we could probably send one out later. I'm happy to showcase the Taplytics one. I think it's a pretty good one, Michael. We can get some traffic to your page there. Um, so that'd be fun to, to send an example later. All righty. Um, Vincent says, what's your experience regarding giving access to a product tour to website visitors? What percentage uplift do you expect regarding signups? Does this impact other metrics such as time from signup to onboard? Um, Michael, I know you threw out some metrics earlier. Anything you can dig into a little bit deeper on that one? Um, I can't dive a little bit deeper, but overall the general trend is that as a product tour, as like another touch point and channel, it increases the probability of that lead converting. It's just about setting up your attribution, right? Understanding where the customer or where the lead is in their journey and not sending them like a sales call if they've just hit the product tour for the first time or whatever. It's just, you need to understand like where, it's important to understand where they are in the journey and providing value appropriate enough for them. A, uh, a common stat I've seen, and then we actually experienced ourselves over at Correlated when we launched um, for people to be able to get started with the product, uh, was somewhere between 10 to 15x conversions. 
which is a lot. <laughs> so you also have to be ready for that side of it, which is a, a great problem to have. Um, and, I, and if for companies that have done launches on Product Hunt, um, same thing, it's about 10x. Um, so that, that, that might be a good metrics to base it off of. Awesome, awesome. Cool. Uh, Nathan says, how do you provide different onboarding experiences for different segments? So for example, enterprise versus mid-market. And I'm happy to take a cut at this one to start. You know, I think it's a great point, right? Not every customer is the same. Not every buyer is the same. As we talked about earlier in the presentation here, there's different types of buyers that may want that hand-holding experience. They want that white glove proof of concept from an enterprise executive or an account executive. So I do think it's really important to look at who are you selling to? And if you sell to a pretty wide range of potential buyers, let's segment those out. Maybe you have your SMBs directly go to a product tour. Maybe you have your mid-market and enterprise go to more of that sales-led motion, just depending on how you want to kind of slice and dice your user base. And really, I think the question comes down to how do you want to spend your sales team's time, right? If it's, if you look at your ACV or lower ACV deal, is it worth the many hours for building that custom proof of concept or that sales-led demo? Maybe not. So I think that is definitely one consideration. Other, other thoughts on segmentation for different styles of onboarding or training? You know, we brought up like amplitude quite a few times. I think also like it goes back to the point where you want to just show specific information based on what they selected as. So maybe an enterprise um, customer wants to see a specific feature set versus a mid-market. And as you pop, pre-populate the data, the dummy data, you just want to like zoom in into the specific feature. So I think that's one way to think about it is, is what are some parts of the products that an enterprise or a mid-market or a small type of customer, or even different type of use cases, SaaS versus e-commerce would care about within the product and really like zoning in on that and describing how this would help them achieve their goal right from the get-go would be super, super powerful. Yeah, I, th I think it's specific to how, what segments are most important to your product. So is it is it integration specific? If you're focused on integrations, then maybe it, it should be a different experience based on what their integrations are going to be. Or um, if you're focused on different you know, there's multiple personas who can use it, but they use it in pretty different ways than focusing it on that persona. Um, so, or use case, like you said, Ramley, same idea. Um, so yeah, I think uh, there's not a one size fits all, but thinking about when you started to have conversations with your prospects and with your customers, um, what those common use cases or personas or, you know, um, look like, then, you can sort of base it off of that. Totally. And I think, you know, ask your users, you know, what do you want? How do you want to experience my product? Did you enjoy this experience to begin with? And I think as you continue to grow and get more data, you'll paint a better picture around how you can service those different segments and, you know, even create smaller sub-segments between how you want to engage with different industries or different buyer types within that. So I think those are all awesome points. Cool. I do have one more question here. Um, we talked about that one. Let's talk about this, this one. I think, Breeze, this is probably very relevant to you all, which is you have your hand raisers. You know, I've gone onto a website, I filled out a forum gate, and I've downloaded my ebook or whatever it is. But I also have my users that have gone through a product tour, gone through that freemium or free trial and actually exploring the product itself. How do you differentiate? How should we kind of segment those users um, in our marketing funnel and our lead funnel. Yeah, I mean, I can dive in a little bit here. So what we do is we help to tie together um, the data around how people are actually using a product with what sales and revenue teams traditionally look at, which is, you know, account data, user data, so demographic, firmographic. Um, and so we, we basically tie all of that data together. And what that allows us to do is in answering your question is looking at who are the hand raisers. That's, that's what we think of traditionally people actually reaching out and saying, Hey, I need help. Um, and there's, there's two different types of hand raisers. There's hand raisers who want support and there's hand raisers who want to talk to sales. So first of all, you know, sussing those two out. Um, and then in product leads, I think you can be looking at a number of different factors. Um, so these can be usage-based. So, you know, if you're, 
like Wistia and you have a certain number of videos that someone can upload um, in their account. So you can look at how much are they using a certain feature, how, or it could be, you know, time-based. You'd be looking at how much they're spending uh, time doing certain activities. Um, you can also be looking at things like, you know, did they click on this feature or did they click that button or did they invite new users to collaborate with them? Um, so a bunch of these different product actions. And what we're seeing is that teams are often layering um, in product uh, actions on top of uh, either user data or account data. Um, and so by doing this, uh, PQL scores are slightly different. So product qualified leads. Um, are slightly different than than what we think of as from an an, an MQL, um, similar but just slightly different in that you're still layering on different data based on actions that people take, right? Like so, our MQL scores are: did they download an ebook? Did they visit our website? Did they visit certain pages on our website? All of those actions. Um, so it's similar, but then you add on different actions that they're actually taking inside of your product. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, the definition for a PQL can, can vary. And also most companies do actually have multiple PQL definitions um, because product led is all about like, you know, you expand here, they expand again, they expand again. Um, and it, it is slightly different in that uh, compared to when you're doing something more sales led, you have like a contract that's maybe a year long or two year long contract. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's sort of the the short version slash long version in a nutshell. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways that people are layering in these product actions to create those in product leads. Um, and then I think you know your hand raisers are more traditionally what we think of when people just kind of reach out or let us know that they want us to talk to them. That's that's awesome. Thank you, Breezy. <clears throat> um, I see a good question from from Sachin, which is. Kind of, a, kind of a loaded question here, you know, is a PLG model more suited towards a lower ticket size, you know, price products, lower ACV products? Um, would love to open the floor there. I'm sure we can go in a number of different directions with that, with that question, but maybe we can get some uh, initial reactions of is PLG for everyone, is PLG for only, um, you know, bottoms up SaaS? Probably one of the most common <laughs> PLG, I'd say, misconceptions is that it's for uh, yeah. low ACV, um, low average uh, contract value. So, um, no, <laughs> I definitely don't think so. Um, but I think there's something that people commonly confuse, and that's what's leading to this misconception. So, I think people often uh, feel like product led growth and sales are separate. You're either a sales-led company and you do sales or you're a product-led company and that's that. Um, very much not the case. And if you look at all of the most successful product-led companies, they also have a sales motion. So when we clear up that misconception and understanding that product-led companies are also, they also have sales teams, they're also doing sales. Um, but the difference is that they're just allowing people to get access to the product and not, not being like gatekeepers. Um, then I think it clears up the confusion around it needing to be a, a low ACV product to be a product led company. So what that would look like in practice is that, yeah, maybe, maybe some of your, your lower, um, some of your lower uh, contracts are people who just came in and you know onboarded themselves and did their own thing. And maybe a more of a majority of your enterprise contracts are, um, you know, were, were sales motions that help to close those. Um, but there's still outliers on both ends of those spectrums. And so there are still sometimes your whale company comes in and uh, they, they self-serve themselves and and they're they come in through that product led journey um but yeah so i think thinking about how sales assists in that helps people understand that you know the acv at product led companies is is across the map you can see that in uh, some of the publicly traded plg companies as well there's definitely some high ticket uh, items in there atlassian being a big one i think yeah. that's, that's spot on go for romley yeah, and, and, and like in terms of all the examples, I think Breezy got ahead on. Like you, you, it's it's more about like trying to de-risk the buying process. And once they find value, they can purchase uh, even if it's high. Like if you look at Amplitude, that's a great example. We've been talking about product led; they're really product led, but they're 
they don't even state their pricing on the pricing page. But I, if I just Google to Google what is the average annual cost for amplitude, there's about thirty to forty thousand annual contract value for that. So you don't necessarily have to be a low purchase value. More so, um, you're trying to really de-risk your situation. Another example is HubSpot, where before their current pricing per month is eight hundred dollars per month is one of their costs, and they open up this freemium approach. So. Uh, it really is going back to what Breeze said, a misconception that it needs to be low ticket. It's more about how can we show value before we try to close this deal and it really does help that close close rate. No, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Olaf did ask you around integrations with Intercom. And I think there's actually conversation to be had around here versus the, uh, the asynchronous versus synchronous product tour, right? Say I go into a website and I have a question. I want to become a hand raiser. I want to say, hey, Michael, I want to learn more about Tapolytics. Can I jump on a call right now? I think that's a good example of where an intercom, a drift, a, a chat widget could make sense on a product tour. But say, for example, it's you know Friday night at 10 p.m. and I'm evaluating B2B SaaS software. <laughs> I want to be able to jump in right there and have that asynchronous experience where I can go in and you know completely self-serve myself, go around, click around the product, and not have to talk to anyone on sales. So I do think there is optionality for both kind of that synchronous and asynchronous with a tool like Intercom or Drift. Um, so I th hopefully that answers that one there, Olaf. I know we have a couple moments left here. Uh, Amy asked around, how can this idea translate to smaller businesses and products? Some of our clients have a niche as in the product's not gonna be for everyone. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Amy, right? So say you're a smaller business, you're growing your product, um, building a product tour, building a freemium can take some time. So I think the idea of a product, I'm sorry, building a freemium, building a product trial can take some time. So I think as you're really evaluating who is your buyer and finding that niche, a product tour can be helpful because you can immediately turn on that PLG funnel, if you will, without having to spend the engineering hours and resources building at that freemium. So it helps you become more of a self-serve solution uh, right from day one. Other, other thoughts around how this can translate to smaller businesses and startups? For an example, I'm sorry <laughs> to, to cut in. Um, <clears throat> one of the products that we recently launched this week is for um, minimalists. So not, not everyone, myself included, can live the minimalist lifestyle, but uh, it was uh, something that he patented. It was a laptop strap. He could not find this nomad artist traveler person he saw this need and he created this product because he needed it there was nothing on the market that he needed and so um but as his pr people you know now we're trying to market that to the right people and we love this idea of letting the the product be the the engine not the caboose so that's why i just wanted to throw that out there also a little bit of shameless promotion <laughs> for my minimalist uh, laptop strap <laughs> Yeah, I, I like it. I think it's all about how do you lead with your product? How do you showcase that value rather than selling from the get-go, right? It's all about the product at the end of the day. Awesome. Um, Mark did ask an interesting question around how does this translate to B2C SaaS? And I'm trying to think some examples right now. Any, any thoughts from the panel around how can we use a product tour as an effective B2C motion as opposed to just B2B? I mean, I think in PLG, we see a, <laughs> we see a lot of lines blurring. We see lines blurring between sales, customer success, marketing. We also see the lines a little bit blurry between B2C and B2B. So um, Calendly would be a great example here. So as an individual consumer, we can go and, and start using Calendly for, for personal things. Um, but if there is also a B2B use case there, which there is, there's Calendly for teams and and uh, there's there's round robin routing and all this stuff inside of their product um, is that this uh, this traction in the B2C market has helped to drive their B2B market because obviously people, as we all know, people become familiar with the product. Also, if I share my Calendly link with you, now you are familiar with Calendly and, and so on. And then when I get a job and we're, we're trying to figure out, oh, how can we, you know, more easily share our calendar as a team, I'll bring up Calendly. And so I think um, 
there's a B2B and B2C line <laughs> that's a little bit blurry um, in, in that example. Um, and then I think, um, I think one of the things that's touching on in B2B, B2C, and, and that you were talking about a moment ago too, is like, what is your, how large is your target audience? So if you are super niche, um, I think a product tour, it could be a good way to, um, to display what you're doing. Um, whereas if you're not so niche and it's, it's a little bit wider, then, then maybe at some point it makes sense for you to put in those engineering resources and have that freemium version of your product. Um, but it, still like the, the in product, like having a tour is, is a good stepping stone to get there. So I think what that's touching on is just like, how big is your target audience? If it's really narrow, um, you might want to think about does is this the best approach for you does it make sense for you to have um this this uh this truly product led jump into the product approach maybe it does um but you have to you have to think about that um and when you have a wider audience obviously it makes a lot more sense let people just get access to it and, and jump in there i think that's great i'm thinking of an example notion so notion i would say there's definitely b2c use cases right where I can go in and, you know, I'm a consumer. I download Notion and start trying it out. If I go to the Notion site today, I can actually jump into a interactive product tour, start clicking around, start trying out their software before I've ever created a free account, before I've ever talked to sales, before I've ever done anything. I can get that value moment right from the website page. Uh, there's definitely B2B use cases as well, um, just like Calendly, like you mentioned, Breezy. So I do think that's a good example of a product tour of more of that B2C use case. Awesome. Well, I know we have just a couple minutes left here. Um, let's see. This is this has been a great conversation, everyone. Just wanted to, to sum it up and say thank you all to the panel. Uh, thank you to our audience. This has been a lot of fun. Um, really excited to continue talking this conversation offline. If you want to reach out to me at randy.frank at nomadic.com. Um, but thank you again, everyone, and really excited for the next one of these we have coming up in a few months. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, Breezy. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks all. Michael. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, everybody. Bye.